Welcome to the Thailand Social Seminar Series, also known as TS4. Um, the series is sponsored by the Sydney Southeast Asian Centre, the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies and the New York Southeast Asian Network. This series brings together social science experts from across the globe to discuss pressing issues facing Thailand. My name is Petra, Petra Desitova and I'm going to be your host for this inaugural seminar. It is my great pleasure to introduce today Kathleen Bowie, who is going to talk to us um, about a really, really fascinating topic that I am pretty sure everybody's very much looking forward to hearing. Her, the title of her presentation, as you can see, is of Harims and Eunuchs, Theravada Buddhist Courts of Mainland Southeast Asia in Comparative Perspective. I don't really think Catherine needs um, too many introductions, but um, I will say that Catherine is a Villas Distinguished Ach Achievement Professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So without further ado, I would like to give floor over to Catherine, um, who will present her, her talk. And following the talk, we will open for Q&A. So if um, you have questions, feel free to posted in the Q&A chat box. And then um, after Catherine has finished her talks, um, I will ask a selection of them. So over to you, Catherine. Thank you very much to Duncan and Petra and Ariana. I have some sense of the work that goes into organizing workshops. So um, appreciate uh, the work and the opportunity to share what I'm doing. So for those of you who know that I'm an anthropologist, you may be wondering how I would have gotten into anything like harems and eunuchs. So it all started with an election in a village in Northern Thailand that I was around for in 1995. And I became uh, curious why this election was so hot and controversial. And I began to appreciate how involved women were uh, behind the scenes in uh, the, the whole election process. And I wanted to know what had changed in the election laws. And so as I was tracking uh, this back, uh, first there was the 1914 law, uh, which was based on a law from 1897. And I was shocked to read uh, and find out that women already had the right to vote in 1897. So Prince Damrong was the uh, author of both the 1897 and the 1914 uh, Local uh, Administration Act. And so I wondered uh, why had he included women uh, if for women's suffrage? It was very early in the history of women's voting rights. Was he a proto-feminist or was he just Thai growing up in the harem or the inner palace? And in 1897, Queen Sawapa was the regent. King Chulalongkorn was in Europe at the time. So that got me interested in wanting to know more about the inner palace and the role of women. And so then I started reading widely, uh, reading about China, uh, the Mughal Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and my students will know that I also uh, uh, justified watching large numbers of historical soap operas as part of this research. And in doing this research, what struck me uh, particularly was the eunuchs, vast numbers of eunuchs. So uh, Alvaro Semedo in uh, 1628 estimated that there were 12,000 eunuchs in the court. Over the course of the 276 years of the Ming Dynasty, there were some 1 million eunuchs employed in the court. In Persia, in the Safavid court, around 3,000 eunuchs. So then I wondered, well, what's, this, what's the deal in Southeast Asia? But before I talk about that, I want to just have us think through what it means to be a eunuch. The castration process, so for the castrati who are opera singers in Italy, uh, they typically uh, damaged or removed the testicles. But for the courts uh, across Asia, it was uh, overwhelmingly radical castration, removing both the testicles and the penis. 
This was a life-threatening process. People died from uh, hemorrhaging or infection. Um, it, was, uh, it was quite something. And it involved uh, a slave trade, uh, bringing in uh, across Africa, uh, Eastern Europe, Central Europe, uh, South Europe, uh, uh, Southern Asia, all, all over uh, into an international slave trade. So I'm going to just uh, divide the Southeast Asia into the non-Theravada and the Theravada world, and I'm going to go country by country, ending then with Siam. The Philippines, there's no evidence of eunuchs. Uh, they had courts, they had uh, uh, harems, but after 1565 with Spanish colonization, they were basically oriented to the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic trade. Vietnam, by contrast, had lots of eunuchs. Um, and it goes back about a, a thousand years uh, that there's evidence of eunuchs. Uh, Samuel Baron in 1688 said there were about uh, four to 500 eunuchs in court. Five of the six provinces were governed by eunuchs. And as late as 1925, the queen mother, uh, the wife of the emperor shown here, uh, had 70 eunuchs in her court. So there are some of the eunuchs and the tombs uh, for the royal eunuchs, uh, some of them in Hue. In the Muslim world, Malaysia, there is no evidence uh, of eunuchs, but in Indonesia, in Java and Aceh, and Java was actually a center for castration. Uh, and in Aceh, there were uh, about uh, 500 uh, eunuchs uh, described in the court in uh, the 1600s. So this gives you an overview of the trade routes. So you can see Manila in the center with the red and orange heading to the Atlantic, and then uh, the blue and the purple representing the trade routes across the Indian Ocean, which were largely dominated by Muslim traders um, up until the uh, 15 and 1600s. So in the Theravada Buddhist world, uh, basically Sri Lanka, Cambodia, Laos, there's no evidence. Uh, I did stumble across a, an obscure uh, moment in the 1300s of perhaps a decade or two under the Madurai Sultanate when a, a eunuch uh, governed uh, Sri Lanka briefly. So now turning to Myanmar, uh, and I'm going to subdivide this into three uh, main kingdoms, the Pegu, Arakan and Ava. And there, the only evidence for Pegu is a Jesuit priest named Nicholas Pimenta, who said that uh, in 1599, when uh, Pegu was being conquered, uh, the king in the last moments uh, massacred 200 eunuchs so that they wouldn't disclose where he had his treasure hidden. Nobody else has confirmed that, but I just mention it so that you know. Arakan <clears throat> had uh, very powerful eunuchs who served as minister of war, prime minister uh, in the Privy Council, uh, involved in international trade, uh, serving as ambassadors for international negotiations. Uh, overseeing, working as architects, overseeing uh, large land holdings, uh, some very powerful figures. There may have also been perhaps about 200 royal guardsmen who may have been eunuchs, but there's no evidence that verifies that. That's just, I'm just sharing the possibility. There's no evidence of castration centers or uh, specialized gelders uh, performing castration in uh, Arakan itself. Uh, all the evidence suggests that these eunuchs would have come from Bengal through the port of Chittagong. And 
here you can see Arakan, Maraku, and there's Chittagong. And uh, Maraku, the Arakan kingdom used to control this whole area. I think the peak of eunuchs would have been during the reign of King uh, Sirisud Hamarata, uh, 1622 to 1638. Thereafter, there seems to be more factionalization. After the loss of Chittagong in 1666, the court had problems with revenue, uh, intensifying factionalization, and I would suspect that the number of eunuchs would have declined. Nonetheless, at the time of the conquest of Arakan in 1785, uh, they still had eunuchs. And we know this because at the beginning of the Kanban dynasty, uh, when they conquered uh, Arakan, they removed uh, you know, all the princes and princesses, all the members of the court. And we know from the record of British envoys Michael Symes and Captain Hiram Cox, who visited the capital then at Amarapura in 1795 and 1796, that there were Muslims in the court, Muslim eunuchs, uh, and Symes described them as prisoners uh, that were taken from Arakan, primarily kept in the court as tokens of military prowess. And Cox specifies that there were six in attendance at the court. Uh, at, during his audience. So uh, uh, the presence of eunuchs continues into uh, Mandalay. And on the right, you can see uh, a photo that I stumbled across of the chief eunuch uh, in Mandalay. So I think this is a picture from about the 1850s to 1880s. And he's described as uh, very powerful. And there are various accounts of him embroiled in uh, succession controversy uh, after King Mindon dies. So now we're ready for uh, Siam. So in the Palace Law of Ayutthaya, which Chris Baker and Pasuk Pumpachit have translated, uh, there are uh, several references to eunuchs. So it's impossible to know when this document was uh, written since it started, you know, sort of compiled in the uh, beginning in the 1400s, but actually not written down this version until the beginning of the Bangkok dynasty. Um, so it's hard to know how to date the presence of eunuchs that appear in the text. But the first European to mention eunuchs is Abbe de Choisy in 1685 during the reign of King Narai. And that is then followed up and confirmed by Simon de la Lubert. And this is from his book. Uh, this here you can see a map of the of King Narai's palace in Lopuri. And up here, these M's refer to the kitchens and lodgings of the eunuchs. So you would enter the palace here. This is the audience. This is where the women's chambers were, and the eunuchs are. Uh, back there. So King Darai is said to have had eight to 10 eunuchs. So we're not talking about a large number. However, I think there were actually more. Uh, Princess Yoda Tape is, uh, who was only 21 at this point, is described as having insolent eunuchs. And I think it's also possible that uh, various uh, high-ranking officials also may have had eunuchs because in uh, an account left by Engelbert Kempfer, uh, he describes the visit of a Siamese envoy to the Safavid Palace in 1684. The envoy himself was Persian and is described as traveling with an attendant who was a Negro and I think it's highly probable that that was uh, indeed a eunuch. The palace law describes, uh, distinguishes between Muslim and Chinese eunuchs. And there seems to be a differentiation that's being made between uh, Indian eunuchs uh, with the king 
and the Chinese eunuchs with the queen. So uh, when the king is leaving the palace to go and uh, go to and get on uh, a barge um, or uh, any of the royal rituals outside of the palace, he's described as being attended by Indian eunuchs. And when the queen is uh, queens uh, and other uh, palace women are going to the river to uh, get on the barges, they're being described as accompanied uh, by Chinese uh, eunuchs. And Chinese eunuchs also delivered messages from the secondary queens. So uh, there, there we have bits and pieces of information that suggest a division between the Muslim and the Chinese eunuchs. And uh, Luber also describes, uh, mentions that there were eunuchs both black and white, which suggests a parallel with the Safavid Persian Empire. So both the Ottomans and the Safavids uh, distinguish between black and white eunuchs. For the Ottomans, the black eunuchs were in charge of the women's harem and the white eunuchs oversaw the military pages. In the Safavid Empire, only uh, the Shah was allowed to have black eunuchs. And the fact that King Narai has the Muslim darker eunuchs with him suggests that he that King Narai was following the Safavid Persian model. And in fact, an account left by a, a Persian um, member of a, a member of a Persian mission uh, traveling to Ayutthaya uh, describes that uh, King Narai already as a boy was going to Persian households. So the earliest <clears throat> important uh, Persians arriving in Ayutthaya is 1602. And they become, uh, one of them becomes uh, the foreign minister, prime minister, uh, his son becomes a foreign minister. The Persians are involved in helping Narai get to the throne. Uh, he uh, apparently wants his king dresses Persian in imitation of Shah Suleiman, who you can see over there on the right. Uh, dresses Persian. He likes to eat uh, Persian food. He has uh, sheep. Uh, uh, raised in court to provide him with mutton. He has a cook flow, uh, brought in from uh, the Mughal court who knows how to cook uh, Persian food. Uh, there's Persian architecture in the court at this time. So a lot of Persian uh, influence, uh, which makes me think that the Muslim eunuchs were first uh, coming into the court during the reign of King Narai. Were there eunuchs before King Narai? Possibly. My guess would be that these were Chinese eunuchs, uh, that Chinese eunuchs tended to specialize in court rituals and commerce. So they were heads of, of uh, the trade departments. There were a lot, Yutia was oriented towards China uh, in all the trade and tribute going back into the 1400s are documented uh, numerous uh, trade and tribute missions to China, some of them uh, even including the sister and consort of the king. So they would have seen, you know, their tribute would have been received by uh, Chinese eunuchs. So they would have had interactions with eunuchs. Uh, and uh, China also sent missions to Ayutthaya, the most famous being the eunuch Admiral Zheng He, who may have made as many as three trips to Ayutthaya. Uh, and it's possible that some of these missions left Chinese eunuchs in Ayutthaya to oversee their commercial interests. So it, this is all guesswork, uh, but that's uh, my best guess. So we know that over time, the eunuchs disappeared. Uh, when did this happen? It may have happened during Queen uh, Yotateyev's lifetime. She was a princess under her father, uh, King Narai, but then uh, had to marry his successor. 
King Petrata, uh, it seems like she was a, a miserable wife because she got implicated in a revolt against Petrata in 1700 and then an assassination attempt in 1709. So it's quite possible that um, there was some punishment for this. She was expelled from the court. Uh, I would imagine that her retinue would have been uh, reduced uh, to keep her from getting into so much trouble. So that is possible that that led to the decline of her eunuchs. Uh, she died in 1736, so that could be an end. Um, then there's, of course, the ending of Ayutthaya in 1767. Uh, and what about the Bangkok era? Well, there are people who have said there were no eunuchs in the Bangkok era, but it just so happens that Anna Lee and Owens records that uh, during the, as, uh, when the monks are coming into the palace uh, for, the, for the women to, to be able to make offerings, that uh, she writes, the priests are escorted to the pavilion by Amazons and two warriors armed with swords and clubs. And the latter are eunuchs. And they are also present in the afternoon, uh, accompanying um, uh, the monks. So uh, that's part of the story that we don't know what to do with, but I'm uh, sharing it with you. So concluding remarks, uh, the Theravada Buddhist courts compared to the other Southeast Asian courts. Did Theravada Buddhism play a role uh, in uh, minimizing the number of eunuchs? I think it's possible. I would point to the rules to be ordained as a monk. Uh, you must uh, verify that you are not a hermaphrodite or somehow uh, otherwise deformed. Uh, so that could have been a factor. If you're a good Buddhist king, why would you in, uh, encourage people to not be able to be uh, ordained as a monk? Women play important roles uh, in uh, Buddhism. Uh, and they would want their sons to ordain to make merit for them. And uh, all of us that have studied mainland Southeast Asia are aware that Southeast Asian men have found lots of things to do with their penises besides cut them off. Uh, you can implant them with rubies and diamonds. And, uh, you know, these are just uh, some of the, you know, their uses, amulets, uh, et cetera. But I think more important uh, than Theravada Buddhism was just the role of women uh, in Thailand, uh, in the Theravada countries, and in fact, across uh, Southeast Asia. Women were very powerful in the court. Uh, these uh, queens were controlling and promote, they're involved in all kinds of commercial enterprises, international trade, uh, in charge of ships. So I don't see eunuchs as policing their sexual purity as much as assisting them in promoting their commercial interests. So uh, I see uh, women in the court as powerful. Uh, they didn't need eunuchs to guard them. They had their own, quote, Amazons, their female palace guards. Uh, so this is uh, in Thailand. Uh, typically, uh, mat, uh, uh, historically matrilineal, matrilocal, men marrying into the woman's village. So I envision kingdoms that were linked uh, through women, from the palace women uh, down through uh, into the provinces, into the villages. And the uh, Theravada courts did not practice uh, intense purda, uh, sequestering women. Uh, so here is a painting of the uh, Konban court in Burma. And you can see that the king and the queen are both uh, uh, at the audience. And just to say that this is not specific uh, to uh, Theravada Buddhist countries. Here's a wood block of female palace guards in Aceh from 1604. 
So here is an overview of patrilocal versus matrilocal societies. And so here you can see that much of Southeast Asia is far more green uh, than uh, China, South Asia, uh, and the Middle East. And so uh, here is a map showing uh, castration from the 13th through the 20th century. And you can see that patrilocality maps very well with castration and very little uh, in Southeast Asia. And so I think uh, this pattern in Southeast Asia is a mix of religion, kingship, and colonialism. Uh, the colonialism I haven't really gotten into, but it's a factor uh, in uh, all of this as well. And so that is how I came from an election in 1995, and I ended up getting interested in harems and eunuchs. So uh, there we are. And I'll end just for purposes of discussion with this slide that summarizes uh, all of the various non-Theravada countries and the mix of whether or not they had eunuchs and the Theravada countries, so. Thank you very much, Catherine, for a fascinating presentation. I would say, who knew <laughs> that this was actually happening back in the day? Um, it's really, really fascinating. So I would like us to move on to the Q&A session. So um, for those of you who have joined the session, please feel free to post your questions using the Q&A function and I will be selecting and asking these questions in there. In the meantime, before we have any questions, I was wondering whether you could maybe tell us a little bit more about the role of colonialism, because as you sort of suggested towards the end, um, you know, colonialism probably played a role and you've talked during your presentation about the role of trade, but um, what do you see or where do you see um, would colonialism come into the mix? Um, I, I see it. So it doesn't look like, for example, in the Philippines, the Spaniards uh, colonized the Philippines and after that uh, trade is oriented towards the Atlantic, but there was no sign of Unix uh, earlier, even though there were Muslim kingdoms in the Philippines. So I, I wouldn't say that there were no Unix in the Philippines because of Spanish colonialism. Um, the, the country where I see it being most relevant is Indonesia mm -hmm. because Aceh, Java was a center of castration. Aceh had a large number of eunuchs in court up until uh, 1699. And actually there, there were four queens that were ruling in Aceh at that time. So the, the eunuchs in the Aceh court I don't think we're filling the same function as they did in China or India or, or um, in the Middle East. But why did they disappear completely? So it looks like by the 1700s, there were no longer any eunuchs. My, my guess is that it had something to do with Dutch colonialism. Mm -hmm. And it seems possible so that Dutch were uh, you know, up to their uh, eyeballs in, in the slave trade. They may not have wanted uh, eunuchs. I mean, eunuchs are much more expensive than mm -hmm. a regular slave uh, right. because they had, the castration process, the recovery period is about three months mm -hmm. uh, and is with a significant mortality rate. My guess is that as the Dutch uh, take over uh, they're more interested in full-bodied slaves than, than eunuchs. I also suspect that the eunuchs supporting the queen were allied with the Dutch, um, or no, were opposed to the Dutch. Mm -hmm. And so when the Dutch came in uh, and there was a new court, that those eunuchs would have been uh, ousted. Mm -hmm. 
So those are some of the ways in which I see uh, colonialism, European colonialism coming into the story. Um, That's very interesting. We've got now questions pouring in, so I'll uh, just pick a few questions to ask. So we've got a question that's um, saying, can you say a bit more about the presence, role and significance of harems per se in Theravada Buddhist kingdoms? Can I say something more about, I'm sorry? About harems uh, in Theravada Buddhist kingdoms. the role and significance of them? I see it uh, primarily as uh, political, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, women, I don't see these women as being sent so much as uh, victims of their father's machinations, mm -hmm. but rather uh, an opportunity for uh, 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 the best women's education so uh, these women uh, were literate um, and they were, uh, you know, embroidery and everything that you need for Buddhist rituals. Uh, but I also see them as linking economically. There's a wonderful passage uh, in Cox's book uh, when he's, uh, is it Cox? describing uh, one of the prince's wives overseeing the loading of one of the international ships. Uh, so I, I, I don't know, I haven't had a chance to, because I got so bogged down in the Unix and sorting all of that out, I haven't had a chance to like back out mm. and think through the broader picture the broader picture of, of harems in comparison with China, the Mughal Empire, the Ottoman Empire, is that all of the kings have a problem with women uh, and uh, the, the women's kinship networks. Uh, because if, you, if you're a king and you marry a powerful woman and she's got powerful kin, they're all interfering in your politics and events. So the Chinese court, to mitigate these powerful clans actually had uh, commoner drafts to, to be able to ensure that all the concubines in the palace were powerless. Uh, the Ottomans only had Christian slaves as concubines. Uh, so their, their queens, uh, queen mothers were uh, former Christian slaves. Not, so they didn't even want to have you know, good wives from good Muslim families. Um, so the pattern for, for Southeast Asia in general is different. The Theravada kingdoms, kings are very often marrying their half sisters and first cousins. Um, so it was much more of a family business, so to speak. Uh, so, I'm not quite sure what I want to do with the Theravada part of the story, mm -hmm. uh, but I see harems as, uh, for Southeast Asian women, uh, they were far more powerful uh, politically and economically than they were in uh, the Chinese Mughal or Ottoman uh, uh, empires. Mm -hmm. So I'd be interested if people have ideas about, uh, you know, better answer to that question. Mm -hmm. so still chewing on it. <laughs> I do actually have a question that's um, probably a little bit related to what you were just saying, but the question is, what about other kind of Buddhism? Is there a reason why being a eunuch was more accepted? Maybe in Theravada courts? One, I don't know to the extent to which they were ex accepted, mm -hmm. I, um, although I, I my intuition is that yes they were accepted there there were very mixed feelings towards eunuchs in china mm -hmm. uh, they were despised uh, in part for political reasons because um, some of them became very powerful also despised because 
they were violating Confucian principles, uh, that you were, uh, your parents gave you the body, you're supposed to take good care of it. You have an obligation as a filial son to produce a male offspring. Uh, and obviously eunuchs weren't able to do that. So eunuchs in China uh, and Vietnam, uh, there's evidence to suggest that uh, they were despised. And at the same time, because they were in this ambiguous category, uh, they also had sort of a, a, a weird kind of power. So in the Ottoman court, the black eunuchs end up uh, in charge of uh, Mecca and Medina and, uh, uh, and in Jerusalem. And they are overseeing the trade from Egypt to Mecca. So I, I, don't, I don't know if the eunuchs in, uh, you know, thinking about Thailand, uh, to what extent they were particularly significant religiously, uh, as opposed to economically, uh, sort of a status symbol for King Narai uh, to show that he was cool, like the Persian courts. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm looking for answers, so uh, <laughs> everybody is welcome to pitch in. <laughs> There is another question basically asking um, in regards to your reference to Sri Lanka, um, if you could maybe comment a bit more on that. Um, if you have any further details on Sri Lanka and the comment goes, in fact, Sri Lanka had South Indian influence such as Chola, Chera and Pandya, sorry for mispronouncing. Then we also had Portuguese, Dutch and finally British occupation since 15 on 1505 till 1948. So I guess that's in reference to the colonial um, question. Yeah, I, I'd be interested in what people think about the position of the Europeans. Um, I guess I'm a cynic because uh, Christians and Muslims uh, and Buddhists all seem to be able to justify a remarkable range of things in the name of religion. Mm -hmm. So there were Christians and Muslims who were justifying the slave trade. Uh, and, you know, in Buddhism, <laughs> they didn't have a problem going to war and capturing slaves. Um, so uh, they didn't, you know, I mean, you're not supposed to kill a mosquito, but uh, it's okay to go to war and kill people. <laughs> and so so I, I'm somewhat cynical. Uh, about I see I see religion more as a language of debate uh, where you use it to justify positions that you hold for other reasons. Uh, yeah, so I mean Sri Lanka is considered to be a Theravada Buddhist country, <clears throat> but there was just this one uh, eunuch who is part of the Sultanate. <laughs> Um, there is another interesting question, and it's about how did eunuchs rise to positions of power? And I guess there is another question that's also slightly related, asking about when you were talking about the different races and the roles these eunuchs of different races were assigned, was there any hierarchy among them? Was there any evidence of racial discrimination that you might have come across? Uh, they, they rose to power because even though most people associate eunuchs with guarding the sexual purity of the harem, because the emperor, the king is worried that, uh, you know, his progeny be his and not some other man's. Uh, in fact, a lot of the kings were... Um, <laughs> they were worried about being assassinated by their own kin, kinsfolk. And so the, the people that they could trust were going to be outsiders who were vulnerable and depended on them for their survival. 
And so these young boys who were castrated in a foreign country and brought to the court to serve the king, uh, some of them became very close to the king as his trusted confidants, uh, his messenger. Um, and so they became the liaison overseeing a lot of the business uh, interests. So they, they became powerful in, in that way. And as they were trusted by the king, being sent out, uh, for example, in Vietnam uh, to rule provinces. Uh, some of them were military commanders because if you're a king, you have to worry about who's staging a revolt. Um, and uh, uh, the part I find so interesting is that well, there's so many parts, but uh, typically in these other empires, even though the slaves were, the, the eunuchs were uh, typically foreign, uh, so they would uh, have to you know, learn the court language, court etiquette, and they're actually training schools. So in Silet, uh, Bengal, uh, you know, there's evidence that they actually had a, a training school. Uh, also in Cairo, um, but these courts, the, the the young boy then became a Muslim, even though he was originally, you know, heathen uh, or a Christian or whatever. Uh, but they typically converted and became became Muslim. And in the Theravada Buddhist courts, it does not seem that the emphasis is on the eunuchs becoming Buddhist. Instead, it's it seems to be emphasized, it's repeated over and over that they're Muslim. So what role Muslim eunuchs, I mean, specified as Muslim eunuchs are playing in a Buddhist court? Uh, is it a, a sign of their religious tolerance? Um, are they uh, language interpreters that you know, the court is wanting to take advantage of the fact that they grew up speaking a, a different language. Uh, perhaps Persian, Bengali was a, a language of trade uh, uh, in part of the region. Were, the, were these the strengths, um, you know, building on the Muslim trade routes? So they wanted Muslim eunuchs. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm open to uh, people's ideas. <laughs> I think just touched upon one of the questions that was also in the Q&A chat. And I, I should probably mention, I've seen that a few participants are raising their hands. Uh, please use the Q&A um, function if you want to ask a question instead of raising a hand. Thank Wait, you. So, I can't um, see. No, don't worry, I, I've got the, the questions here. Um, so basically, there was actually this question, and I think you partly answered it, but it was if, if a eunuch cannot become a monk, can they become a bhikkhuni or um, a spirit medium? That was what the question says, but uh -huh. I guess that was probably, as you already alluded to, maybe was very little motivation for them to even try to become Buddhist per se, right? They, I don't, you know, there's so little information that it allows for a fair amount of creative writing and mm -hmm. infinite speculation. Uh, so I could imagine that just as uh, in Southern uh, Thailand, Buddhist villagers historically went to Muslim events and Muslims went to Buddhist events uh, up until the time when things get uh, tense. I could imagine that uh, just as I, when I'm in Thailand, I, I'm going to a wide variety of event, events uh, just to show my support for a friend who's of a different religious persuasion or whatever. So I could imagine that eunuchs were supporting uh, Buddhist institutions. Uh, the architects may well have been building uh, Buddhist institutions um, at the same time as they were supporting uh, Muslim activities. Whether or not they were uh, spirit mediums, um, it's possible. I mean, part of the question is what happens to eunuchs when they're not in the court. Um, the, you know, elderly eunuchs have in in China. It's it was a rather depressing story. Um, they most of them had not been able to save up much money. 
and were expected to return to their natal village where they were shunned because they had not produced an offspring for their parents. Uh, so as they ended up supporting, in many cases, Buddhist temples. So during their life, while they were uh, a, 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 you know, a palace eunuch, they were making donations to Buddhist temples so that they would have somewhere to go in their old age. And that seems to have also been the pattern in Vietnam. There is um, also an interesting question whether there was any significance uh, played by the opening of Suez Canal in 1869 and the spread of liberal ideas in the disappearance of eunuchs. Um, the, there's definitely signs that in the 19th century, there is growing uh, critique of uh, the institution of eunuchs and the slave trade in general. But already in India, um, Jahangir had already tried to suppress the trade in uh, eunuchs uh, in Bengal. Um, didn't seem to have much success, but uh, so in the, in China, they suppressed the number of eunuchs, uh, not so much because of European influence uh, or any noble principles, but because during the Ming dynasty, there were so many eunuchs by the end of the dynasty. Uh, there were a huge burden on the court in terms of all the, all the people that had to, all the eunuchs that had to be fed. Um, but they were also, many of them had become very powerful politically. And so the Qing dynasty uh, refuses to educate eunuchs. Under the Ming, uh, eunuchs had, had uh, received at least basic schooling in, in the court eunuch school. But under the Qing, uh, they, he wanted to, uh, the early Qing uh, emperors wanted to keep eunuchs uh, basically illiterate and apolitical. Um, so trying to explain the overall decline, um, I, I, I have to do some more thinking about it. I, I was focused more on the Treaty of Amasya that gave access to uh, the Ottomans and the Persians to the Indian Ocean for contributing to the spread. It looks like Probably the 1600s and 1700s look like the golden age for Unix. Uh, if, if when, when it should be, I don't know, opposite from a golden age. The, but definitely, it looks like that's the time when they were the most. Mm -hmm. uh, and what contributed generally to the decline is uh, something that would be is fun to, to try to think through. But that's a possibility. But I, I don't credit Europeans. So I wouldn't say that the Suez Canal meaning that now somehow Europeans were coming and they had uh, liberal enlightened ideas, uh, I'd be reluctant to, to uh, go too far with that. That's the cynical part of me. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that question. And I'm afraid we are very much nearing the end of the session. So I only have um, time for one final question. And it's a, it's a, if, if I could ask you for a very quick um, answer to that one before we close, but there is a, a question whether there are any biographies, autobiographies or historical accounts of eunuchs in Buddhist Southeast Asia, if you could some, recommend something. I have actually been amazed that there has been so little attention paid to eunuchs. You know, unlike eunuchs in China and everywhere else, it doesn't seem that this has been on people's radar, largely because it turns out that there really aren't that many. But in, for Vietnam, there are some biographies. Um, uh, and Ashraf Khan in Arakan uh, has received some, some attention. Um, I suspect if more historians were paying more attention, uh, we could ferret out some more. So yeah, I think if a lot more eunuchs deserve attention for, for what they endured uh, 
as typically young boys. Indeed. Well, thank you. That's a very nice um, note to finish this this talk on. Thank you so much again, Catherine, for joining this uh, inaugural series session of and for presenting this really fascinating account of um, eunuchs and harems in Therawada, Southeast Asia. So thank you also to all our listeners and to those participants who have joined today and watched this presentation. So it was a real pleasure hosting um, today's seminar. So thank you very much. And hopefully we'll see you all on a regular basis. Our next seminar is in a month's time. Um, and you can see, thank you, Catherine, for showing <laughs> that. So we've got um, another event organized on the 14th of October. Be careful, because I think time-wise, this one actually works mostly for Asia and Australia, not so much for Europe. But I can say that um, all these webinars will be uh, transformed into videos and you can then watch them from YouTube. So if you cannot watch it live, um, don't worry, they will be on YouTube. So thanks again. Thank you very much for joining and have a good uh, evening, afternoon or night wherever you are. <laughs>